So uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for another episode of the JN Irrigation Training Series. I'm your host, Richard Rastuccia, I'm Vice President of Water Management Solutions for Jane Irrigation. And, um, you know, each week we've been bringing you a couple episodes of this, talking more and more about practical side of uh, irrigation, whether it be for landscape or for agriculture. And today we're going to be talking about the right drip tape for your crop. And why this is important, I think, is that uh, there's really a lot of choices out there. And I think that when you're thinking about what drip tape should I be buying for my crop, I think we start to uh, get a little confused, maybe a little overwhelmed at what we needed to look at. So I was talking to Michael Pippen about this a few weeks ago, and he said, you know, there's some basic steps, some questions you can ask and very easily and quickly solve this issue. When I heard that, you know, I like a quick and easy and I like solving issues. So I was very interested in finding these uh, quick steps to take to figure out what the right drip tape for uh, my crop is. So uh, as you guys know, we've got Michael Pippen back today to uh, take us uh, through this. And, you know, Michael Pippen's one of my favorite presenters. And uh, one of the main reasons why is uh, he's grown up in agriculture. Uh, he's actually worked it, breathed it, lived it. Uh, he also has experience as a, uh, as a dealer. And now he's got manufacturer experience as well. The other thing a lot of you might not know about Michael is his love for education. He was really involved with the Irrigation Association and uh, what they do for uh, education. Uh, and more importantly, he's a lifelong learner. He's always looking for ways to do things better than he's done them in the past. And what's really great for his customers is he's always willing to share this idea, this concept to get better, to learn more and apply what we're learning to what you're doing out in the field. And uh, his customers really get a big benefit from that. So uh, with that, I want to say, hey, uh, uh, good afternoon, Michael, and uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I appreciate the, the kind introduction as always, Richard. It's a it's a, um, a great opportunity to share a little bit about what I've learned and, and hopefully we can learn something together uh, moving forward. But yeah, I think you're, the topic uh, that we picked today is, is pretty pretty spot on. It is, um, you know, uh, drip tape is kind of one of the cornerstone products of our drip and micro irrigation industry. And so, you know, we sometimes forget about these, you want to consider them older product lines because people that like us that have been in the industry a long time, you know, we feel like we might have talked about them as much as we possibly can. But after you and I were kind of discussing this and what we wanted to do today, um, I, I've had, it, maybe I've been paying more attention to it, but I've had two like really pretty in-depth uh, drip tape conversations about selection of tape. And, and one came from a dealer who's relatively experienced, but just, you know, was like, hey, this is what we've been doing. Um, does that make sense? Is this what we should be doing? Is there something better? And we had a good conversation around that. And then yesterday with the end user uh, that was relatively new to drip tape, you know, they kind of have a year under their belt and, and planning for next year where we're like, hey, this is what we did. It worked pretty good. Um, what, what, what else could, should we be looking at and should we be considering? So that's kind of the springboard into this conversation today. And, and hopefully we'll do a, a good job of, of, of narrowing down some of these options and to, to help us be as definitive as we can about what, what's a good product selection for, for your specific application. So one thing that I think always comes up for people, and we've got a lot of landscape viewers, you know, that watch uh, pretty regularly, and uh, landscape is always using or mostly using a emitter line. And uh, what, what's the difference between a emitter line and drip tape? I would say the single biggest difference is the tubing um, that the product is made out of, or the way that it's made. I guess probably a better way of saying drip drip tape is in general much thinner, a more short-term product than the emitter line, which is uh, more, more bulletproof, if you will, a thicker product. That's the biggest difference. Uh, there are some differences in the style and the type of emitter that's typically used in those products as well. But in reality, they're both a tubing that has a dripper or emitter, a hole, if you will, every so often letting out a certain amount of water. So they are very similar in the, the way that they function. Uh, but a drip tape is really a, a thinner product uh, that primarily started being used in short-term crops, uh, like fruits and, uh, say, vegetable production, fresh vegetable production, and has migrated its way into 
um, more um, crops like uh, commodity crops, soybeans, cotton, corn, and those type of things. But in general, would be used in more of a seasonal type of crop, even though it might be used for multiple years. Right. And then the other thing, the visible difference to me is that drip tape is flat. And it actually gets round when you uh, when you when you put water in it, but uh, it, it's flat, right? That's right. I mean, that's kind of where it gets its name is tape. Like when you roll it off the coil before you pressurize it, it's flat, just like a piece of tape would be. So it it is thin enough uh, that when we coil it, it will compress down to a flat pro, pro, you know a flat profile where a tubing is almost always going to hold its profile. So it has a thick enough wall that it comes out. And in a in a in a in a, in a hose circle um, as you install it. So yeah, that that's really a difference of the of the wall thickness and how we manufacture it and package it. So then, how do I figure out right? And there's a there's a lot of different drip tapes. I, I see all the different ones in the Jane catalog. Uh, how do I figure out which uh, which drip tape I need for what I'm what I'm growing? Right. If you'll bear with me with a short analogy, it is a lot like picking out a a vehicle or if you're going to the dealership and picking out a new truck, right? There are um, a lot of makes, a lot, a lot of models, and within those models, there's a lot of features and specifications, right? And so um, more than likely, there are multiple trucks that would fit your need and application, right? There are some that don't, some that might work, and then there's a group that will work. Um, and that's kind of what you'll see here in this presentation today. We're gonna try to narrow that down to what fits your application best as specifically as we can. Um, but there's always gonna be some economic components and there's also gonna be some preference components that, that play in at the very end where you might have a couple of options still and this you might have more um, understanding of or it might be manufactured closer to you so it's a little bit better price point. There's always a little bit of judgment there at the end. Um, but yeah, we're gonna try to narrow this down as, as tightly as we can working through these makes and models and, and uh, features if you will. And uh, also, you know, they're, they're, I've spent most of my time in the central and the eastern region, kind of Texas east. And so, you know, I will say there are some regional differences that, um, that, that you know, someone may or may not agree with what exactly I'm, I'm presenting. And I'd always, always say, yeah, we'd love to hear those comments, right? You probably got the chat box open. So we'd love to address those questions and comments on, on the webinar, right? So if you have some of those, drop them to Richard. He'll feed them to me and we'll, we'll try to try to work through those um, if anybody has kind of, you know, some opinion about what I'm, what I'm saying, but, um, but yeah, we, we basically got to answer two kind of four questions, but about two different types of specifications. We got to talk about the emitter. We got to pick out how, how many drippers we're going to put on this tube, you know, how close we're going to put them together. Um, and then we're also going to have to figure out how much water comes out of each one of those drippers. There's a lot of options there. Uh, then we'll also talk about the pipe then, you know, we got thicknesses. We've already talked about the drip tape being pretty thin, but there's a lot of options in that. And then the diameter, you know, how big of a hose we're going to actually use. So those are kind of the specifications that we're going to look at. And uh, we're going to tackle the, the drippers first. That's the one we're going to look at the first time. So Michael, each one of these uh, emitters or each one of these holes that I see in the drip tape uh, does have an emitter or are there, or are there some that are just uh, holes placed in the tape? They're, they all have an emission device. They're all regulated. There's a regulated output, a, a goal, a, a target, if you will, that we're trying to emit out of each one of those drippers. So, you know, they, they're not just simply holes. Uh, there are uh, designed and specified outlets that give us a certain amount of flow rate. Um, when we talk about those emitters, uh, really and really specifying a drip tape, the logical jumping off point is is what are you growing, right? That's the that's the very first thing we want to talk about. Obviously, that answers a lot of questions. You know, are we growing you know containers in a nursery? Are we growing strawberries out in the field? Are we growing cotton, corn, or peanuts in a in a commodity crop? You know, what what are we growing? That, uh, that question will answer things about plant density, uh, what the plant population looks like. Uh, it's gonna talk, I think I have root depth shown here, but it could be, you know, we talk about the root depth or how aggressive that root structure is moving laterally. Um, that also gives us kind of some hints about the soil characteristics, you know, different types of plants are planted in different types of soils. So that question of, of what you're growing um, it seems pretty simple, but it unpacks a lot of the, a lot of these uh, for us and helps us make these selections. Um, I, I would suggest 
that on the closer space, if you look kind of on the left-hand side of the chart there, um, you'll see four, four inch space is really about as, as tight as we go. Um, and then you kind of get all the way up to the uh, far right and you have like a 24 inch space product. And so um, if you look at some of the typical crops there uh, in, a, in a four inch space, you would look at a lot of containers like nurseries. We're working with a guy this week that was doing organic cucumbers in a greenhouse. And so they basically had these little containers that you have just one little cucumber plant. Well, obviously it can't really get any benefit from a dripper being, you know, 12 inches away from it. So we use a really tight spacing in order to get like a dripper in each one of those containers. So that's really popular, those tighter spacings. You'll see that a lot in nurseries. I've seen it with like uh, citrus production for uh, newly grafted trees that were going to be sold out in the field. We've used a really tight spacing for that. Poinsettias. Um, mums that you'll see a lot of those tight four inch spacing in those kind of container nursery applications. When you start getting a little bit wider, like six inch and eight inch, you'll see that used a lot out in the field with really high density planted vegetables, onions, garlics, those type of things that have might have a, a bed, a raised bed, and might have three or four or more rows of plants going down that same bed. And so without a really big root structure to deal with, so you got to get those drippers pretty close together so that they get water about the same time, right? If you have a dripper that's further away, it might wet that bed appropriately, but it might take it a little bit longer to get out to the edge. So you'll see some tighter spacings in those. Um, eight and 12 inch, and even maybe 16, but, but definitely eight and 12 inch, I would say are, are tools to go after uh, the fresh vegetable and fruit markets. Uh, peppers, tomatoes, strawberries, melons. Uh, we always, you know, as a designer, you know, 12 inch kind of works on everything. It might not be the perfect for everything, but you can take a 12 inch space and do a lot of stuff with it. And so, you know, you look at eight and 12 inch, you'll see a lot of these, as we go through this presentation, that's, that's a real common recommendation. It works well. Melons you'll sometimes see out in the wider eight, 16 inch spacings. And then when we get into you know, some of our permanent, which we call SDI, subsurface drip irrigation systems, like in our commodity crops, corn, cotton, peanuts, uh, soybeans, you'll see even wider spacings, 18 to 24 inch spacings, and even wider, some 27s, 30s, and even occasionally a 36. So you can kind of see, depending on what you're growing there, that 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 will definitely get us in the range. You know, which, which spacings should we be considering depending on the plant that we're growing. It gives us a, a lot of indications about the, the environment that we're working with. So, Michael, when I buy my drip tape, uh, do I go in the dealer and they have four, six, eight, twelve on the shelf, or this is something I order? How, how does that work? Um, both. Uh, I would say that a lot of dealers do kind of stop. Like, if you take a dealer that's working in, in kind of a market that deals with the fresh fruits or vegetables, they're going to have some eight, some 12 and some 16 inch sitting on the shelf. I mean, that's just what they're going to do. You know, they're going to have a customer base. that's going to be pretty specific about what they need. They might get something a little bit different, but their basic customers are going to go and get their 12 inch or their eight inch that works well for their region. Uh, and that's why I say some of the plantings, if you're working with strawberry growers in Florida, they're all going to use a relatively similar product, maybe some variances to it, but relatively similar. So that dealer is going to have the most common product sitting on the shelf. But all of these things are built here um, and by Jane in the, in the United States in Fresno and Watertown, Fresno, California and Watertown, New York. So it's not uncommon for us, a guy that wants something a little bit un, uh, like, for example, that four inch product. That's not a typically stocked product for our for a dealer. So in a couple of weeks, we'll get it built and sent up there to them. So a little bit of both. It can definitely be custom ordered, but most dealers are going to have common SKUs for their region and their growers sitting on the shelf, at least some stock. Okay, great. They're going to be familiar with what pe what their customers are growing, and they're, they're going to anticipate the demand and 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 have it. That's right. And and really, kind of the next step, you go, you got all these emitter flow rate options, right? How much water is coming out of all these drippers? And so that's really the next step. So you said, okay, well, maybe I would like a twelve inch because I'm growing, you know, tomatoes, and that's a that's kind of a, a, a that's a real popular spacing for uh, both processing tomatoes and and state fresh fresh market tomatoes is a 12 inch spacing, but how much water comes out of that? And you look down here and you go, man, I don't even know what some of these numbers mean, right? 0.1 gallon an hour, 0.13, three O's. And, and you start having to figure all this math and everything. It gets, this is where it starts getting a little complicated. 
And I would say the flow rate specification, in my opinion, is harder than a spacing specification. Because in a flow rate specification, you really can't just say, you know, look at soil characteristics and these three work for this soil characteristics. And then you look at the design and of those three, two of them work. And then you look at the water quality and you narrow it down to one. It really doesn't work that way. You really kind of have to evaluate at least these three things and, and maybe kind of converge at the same time to find one that kind of fits all three of these categories. It's a, it's a little challenging. And so I would suggest that soil characteristics is one thing that we would consider first, or maybe the, the primary thing that we can consider. Heavier soils, we're going to use the lower flow rate drippers to try to match the intake rate of the soil to the application rate of our dripper. We get too high of a flow rate, we can get some channeling, we can get some water moving to the surface, and it starts negating some of the advantages of having a drip irrigation system. We don't want water at the surface evaporating. We're uh, supposed to be keeping it down below the soil, right, in general cases. So you'll see some of the heavier soils move towards these lower flow rates on the left-hand side of the chart, 0 0.10, 13s, 17s. Sandier soils will tend to be on the, on the, on the right-hand side of the chart, but 2.6, 3.0s, even higher, because those sandier soils just can't hold as much water. So it goes from wet to dry quicker. And a lot of those applications, we have to get that water kind of back charged into the system a little bit quicker, try to make that water, force it to move laterally. And those higher flow rate drippers do a, do a little bit better job of that in some cases. Um, when I say design considerations, a lot of times I'm, I'm just talking about run length. The, the longer your rows are, um, then the lower flow rates, you can run longer as far as distance wise versus a higher flow rate. There's more water going out. And so there's more, you know, pressure loss in that pipe and some of your uniformity, some of your advantages go away. And so the longer run that your rows are, typically the lower the flow rate of your, of your drippers will need to be. And then also water quality. In, in general terms, the higher the flow rate, the bigger the hole. And so that's more clog resistant. A big hole is more clog resistant than, than a small hole. And again, there's some variant, there's some gray areas in there, but you could see a situation to where you said, oh, well, I have a sandy soil, so I need a high flow rate. But if you haven't considered your design, then you know you maybe have a long row. So that says, oh, that's a, a low flow rate. Well, those things kind of contradict each other. You have to find some middle ground in there to where, okay, I have a sandier soil, but pretty long rows, what dripper should I be looking at? Where does that overlap? And that's why I say it gets a little bit more challenging um, because the emitter flow rates, you really are kind of looking at three, at least three different kind of considerations to try to narrow yourself in on something. So an example would be, you know, sandy soils, relatively long run times. I'm going to talk a little bit more, let's run links. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute to find that a little bit better, but sandier soils, long runs, reasonably good water, you know, you're probably going to be sitting in here somewhere in this middle flow rate, 1720.26, uh, rather than over here where I have the sand at, right? You're probably going to be kind of have to sit here in this middle part because of the run length and the water quality issues. You know, if you have good water, that, that's, e that's great. Then you can just kind of mark that off and say, oh, I can use whatever I want to in terms of good water. So sometimes that goes away, but not often. Normally, there are some water quality issues somewhere along the line that we have to address. So a little bit more challenging the spacing, but the flow rates, you can kind of see there are some general places that the flow rates are used with, in, in terms of soil type, run links, would we'll bind that a little bit better later, and, and water quality. Now, Michael, I'm looking at these um, these gallon per hour rates, uh, 0.13 or 0.2. Does it really matter? Yeah. Am I going to see a difference uh, in my crop uh, based on that? Uh, I, I would argue that you would. Um, you know, we'll see it defined a little bit better, I, or I say better, differently in some other specifications where they talk about gallons a minute per 100 feet. Right. And so, yeah, it can it can be pretty negligible when you talk about dripper to dripper, dripper to dripper. But when you start looking at the total profile of that field, um, it can change quite a bit. A 0.17 to a 0.20, that, that's pretty small. So you're right there. But you start talking a 0.17 to like a 0.26. And then that can considerably change the amount of water that you're putting out in a, in a field, especially if you're using a tighter spacing like an 8 or a 12 inch. And you know, if you're on a wider spacing, not that big of a deal. You know, 16, 24 the, in spacing doesn't change as much, but it can it can add up quick quickly with a tight row, a tight emitter spacing. Yeah. 
So we've got a pretty good question here, Michael, and uh, this is it. Is there any relationship between the emitter spacing and the finished width of the wetted band? Uh, all things being equal, taking into account soil type and soil structure. If I, if I uh, understand that question correctly, it would be the, uh, how big of an area, does, is the area that's covered affected by the emitter outlet, right? If I'm doing less water, do I have a smaller surface? And if everything else would, would be equal, I would say most likely. Uh, your wetted profile, I don't have a, a picture of that here, but it kind of has this onion shape, right? It starts pretty narrow where the water drips out and then it comes as the water moves through the soil profile, it kind of widens out and then it narrows back in. And in general, your higher flow rate drippers uh, will, that will, uh, that onion, that bulb of that onion will be a little bit larger on a, a higher flow rate dripper. So, um, the difference there would be, you might have a plant structure that doesn't have roots that deep, right? So there could be some things where that didn't make a difference out in the field. While your wetted, wetted profile would be different, um, it wouldn't really affect your field. Um, so, so yes, I think that the answer to that question would be yes. The higher um, emitter output, you're normally going to see a little bit more wider band, but it can be, be negligible depending on your soil type that you're working in. Right, right. And then for the clay soil again, right? It's gonna it's gonna get wider faster, uh, and right. uh, and therefore have a, a better wetting pattern or a wider wetting pattern, uh, and that's why you need the, uh, the, the the smaller flow rates. That's right. I mean, you normally you know better or more than likely just different, right? You know, you could in theory have a too wide of a wetted band, you know, if you were doing a single row of plants and you were putting water all the way out to the edges of the bed, you know, you could in theory do that. Um, you know, we haven't, as a, as, a, as a manufacturer, we try not to design things that are gonna operate in those uh, fringes where that would be, you know, we wouldn't put a flow rate out there so high that you could have that problem, but you can see it, right? It's, it can be something that where a, uh, a, a too high of a flow rate in a heavier soil could put, push water outside of your root profile. That can definitely happen. Right, and so now we're gonna talk about wall thickness and I'm looking at the subsurface drip and mainly thinking about your presentation on uh, cotton. And I think right. uh, we, we've had tapes last as much as uh, 30 years plus, right? In a study in Kansas. That's, uh, that's, that's correct, yeah, yeah. So you hit, hit the nail on the head, right? What, where are we talking about with thickness? And you're really balancing system longevity versus economics in a lot of ways. You know, um, I, if if it all all these thicknesses cost the same, everybody would get the thick stuff because it in general lasts longer, right? It's just thicker, it's heavier. Um, but that's not the case, right? A lot of these seasonal crops, even if they're high value crops like a strawberry crop or something like that, you know, it really just doesn't make sense to spend the money on something that's going to last 20 years. We want something that lasts a year. And uh, we want it to last that year, but we don't want it to necessarily pay for something that's going to last multiple and multiple years if we're not going to use it. <clears throat> and so that's really what you're balancing there and the system economics. Most of your seasonal vegetables, I'm going to narrow this down pretty easily. Most of your seasonal vegetables are going to be a six and an eight meal. Um, you will see uh, some pest pressure differences in those products um, in the seasonal vegetables. Um, say you had an area that had some fire ant problems or you've had some history of mole crickets, things like that, you would probably navigate, you know, kind of gravitate towards that eight mil, maybe even a 10 mil product. Um, but a lot of our growers will start that eight mil that works for most application on seasonal vegetables. They might try some six, see if you can get away with it, save some money, longer coils, everything, pro the insulation process is a little bit faster. But, you know, that, that's really where you're going to be for most seasonal vegetable crops. If you look at really short crops, um, and really light soils, uh, like we see kind of out in California, West Coast, I, I don't see very much less than, I, I actually prim primarily use eight mil in the central and eastern regions. Um, we do some six, uh, and then when you go out west, you'll even see some five mil. I've never used five mil in my, five mil in my markets but, that I've worked, but we definitely sell a lot of five mil out west in, the, in California. And so those are very short season crops. Don't give the pest long enough time to actually get in there and tear stuff up. If you have uh, rats out in your field, they don't care if it's six mil or 10 mil or 
15 mil, right? They'll chew through anything that you've got. So it really, in these seasonal crops, you're talking about more like insect pests, and you can move from the six to eight to 10 and kind of negate some of those. I'd say the biggest thing with the seasonal crops and the thinner mills is how do you get the product installed and how do you get it back out? And so once you get it in the field installed, it could last a really long time as a six mill, but is your soil heavy or cloddy or rocky and is gonna groove that six mill when you install it? Is it a heavier clay that after a season of wetting, drying, wetting, drying of that, of that bed, is it gonna turn into a brick and you're not be able to pull that tape up without stretching it or breaking it? So again, you know, you talk seasonal crops, <clears throat> there would be a lot more six mil and five mil used if we could get up out of these heavier clay soils. Uh, but pulling it up is a disaster, it breaks off in pieces, you know. And so that, that again, kind of drives that to closer to that six or eight mil, the soil characteristics and the installation and retrieval process. For our subsurface drip irrigation systems, like you've alluded to before, we're almost all 13 or 15 mil. Um, you will occasionally see a 10 mil project, project, project out there that would be, you know, they want like five to 10 years out of it. I've done some sweet corn that way. Um, but m almost all of our uh, commodity crops that the subsurface drip is used in, cotton, corn, peanuts, soybeans, that's going to be 13 or 15 mil product. So pretty similar. I mean, pretty, pretty easy to get this narrowed down. What am I growing? Seasonal vegetables. You need to be probably looking at six, eight, 10 permanent installation is 13, 15. And then if you're really experienced grower and you want to try some lighter stuff, we do offer that for, for economic advantages. And that is pretty popular out West. Hey, so the uh, 15 mil, is that about the size of uh, a midter line too? Would that be about what a uh, midter line <laughs> thickness is? No, it's still quite thick. Most of our emitter line is going to be 40 mils or thicker. We run a lot of 42, a lot of 45, and even some 50 mil. So even a 15 mil drip tape is a third of the thickness of an emitter line. So it's still relatively thin in terms of tubing, right? It's, it's, it's a thin product still. Wow. And you're still getting great uh, many years of use out of that. That's amazing. Right. And those systems, a part of, again, why they're, they're so thick is we're installing those at 12 inches, maybe even 16 or 18 inches deep. So the, the installation process is pretty rigorous. Um, and then we want the longevity. Even if you have a, a small insect or pest problem, if you have a little bit of problem for 20 years, that can add up, right? So a seasonal crop, a, a small prop pest problem, you'll never hardly see it. Um, just because of the time frame that's in the ground, but a small pest problem over the course of many years can turn into a big problem. And that's, that, those are really the reasons behind those heavier walls as the installation progress process is a little more rigorous, uh, soils tend to be a little heavier and then just to negate uh, pest problems because they're going to be in the ground so long, just gives them a lot of opportune time to, to, to mess up your tape. We're going to talk about diameter now. I love this slide that you put up there for maximum run lengths because really diameter all, all ha diameter has only to do with how much water I totally have to uh, uh, flow at any one time, right? You, you got it. So then we're going to kind of pull all this stuff together here and, and talk about, you know, tomatoes in Florida, right? That's where I live. That's where we do a lot, send a lot of product. And, and we've decided for our tomatoes in Florida, um, that we're going to use a 12 inch spaced product with our 0.26 dripper. <clears throat> so, so what size tubing do we want to want to pick out? Do we have to have a 5 8, 7 8, or what do we need? And the one thing that we would ask next is, okay, well, how long are your rows, right? Now we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna negate we're gonna narrow this topic down to the, the run length. There the, there are some other things to consider, but we're gonna look at run length. That's the main driver here. Um, and we're gonna say we have a, a 600 foot long run. So if you can see my pointer here, we've got 12 inch spacing. Let's just say these are uniformity numbers here as an industry standard. Let's say we wanna be above 90%, right? We're gonna draw that line in the sand and say we wanna be above 90%. So 12 inch spacing, 90% uniformity, which is pretty good, 0.26 dripper. Our maximum run length here is 548 feet. Okay, we might have a little bit of a problem here, right? Because we've got 600 foot long run. So one option that we could do is just get a bigger pipe, right? We'll use a seven eighths product, seven eighths, 12 inch, 0.26. We can run all the way up to 950 feet. 
655 feet, we're at 94% uniformity. So we're really, really good here, right? We're 94 plus percent uniformity going up to a seven eighths tape. Life is good, right? But there's a cost that comes with that, right? Seven eighths tape is a bigger pipe. It costs more. So what are our other options? And so whenever I would look at a situation like this as a designer trying to trying to show my grower, you know, what, what could you look at? We can always lower the flow rate in that run and get longer lengths, right? So we can lower that total flow rate by changing the spacing, make it further apart, or pick a different emitter. So in this application, you could say, all right, I, I really like the 12-inch space. I really like that. So could I go down to a 0.17 dripper instead of a 0.26? Sure. You would be, remember, 600 foot. So we'd be 92 plus percent uniform. So that would work. Um, if you like the 12 inch and you're okay with changing emitter, you don't want to change emitter. Okay. Let's stay with a 0.26 and let's widen it out. Let's look at a 14 inch spacing. You can see you're at 611 feet here. So that would work and keep you above 90%. Or maybe you go out to a 16 inch and now you're nine, almost 92%. So, so that would work for you. You know, so you could look at, um, changing your spacing and keeping your big dripper because maybe there's some water quality issues there. Um, you don't want to change your dripper. You don't want to change your flow rate. Fine. No problem. We'll just go up to a seven eighths product, right? So uh, we might just spend a little bit more money on the product, but now you've got the exact flow rate and the exact spacing that you would need. But you can see how we kind of narrow this thing down. We've got some pretty good options here. We can go with your 12 inch, two six and a seven eighths. If you want to save a little bit of money, we can go to a five eighths and either go to a 14 inch or 16 inch spacing, keep your big dripper. Or if you really like 12 inch, we'll drop down to 0.17 and, and you can get that done with a 5 eighths as well. So we've narrowed that down to about three choices. And some of that's going to come down to preference and, and experience and what they feel like is most important quality or feature for, for their field. Uh, this is presented in a little bit different way. And I like this, this chart with, uh, with the graphical lines in here. This uh, 12 inch 0.26, if you convert that uh, 12 inch emitter, 0.26 gallons an hour. If you convert that to gallons a minute per 100 feet, um, do a little bit, take a little bit of the math out of the, out of the, out of the equation for you. You'd be sitting right in here between kind of 0.4 gallons a minute 100 feet and 0.5 gallons a minute 100 feet. You can say 600 foot run is a little bit, little bit too much for us with where we were at. So what this chart shows, I think a good job of is saying, okay, we can we just need to lower our flow rate per 100 feet closer to this 0 0.40 and now your 600 foot is is perfect no i don't want to change my flow rate i don't want to change my emitters i don't want to change my flow rate that works great for me perfect no problem you drop down here to the 7 8 product and here's where you're at you can run out 900 plus feet so there's a there's several options that you can manage this this run length with your spacing and your flow rates that you feel like would work best for you. You know, I just took a screenshot of this chart, right? So I would have it, but where else can I find this chart? Well, this chart and actually a little bit better tools are on our website, Jane, J -A -I -N -S -USA com. So janesusa.com. We also have a run length calculator. We want to get in the weeds a little bit here. If we go back, the reason I showed this, I picked these numbers out to kind of kind of show, um, kind of, I'd say, the, the full picture here. If you remember in our example, we wanted a 12-inch space, 0.26 dripper. That was the one we wanted. But we also wanted to stay above 90% uniformity, 600-foot run. A run length calculator here, we can put all these different emitters and spacings. Once you kind of get this thing narrowed down to a couple of options, your dealer, myself, uh, or you can get on there and use this tool to kind of figure out, you know, okay, we're, let's get in the weeds a little bit. 600 foot run with our 12 inch 0.26 is 89% uniform. So now you have the full picture, right? You go, okay, my five, I want to, here's my targets, 90% uniformity, 600 foot run, 12 inch 2.6. Um, I'm at 89. Is that good enough for me? We can talk through that as a designer. You want to get up to the higher higher uh, uniformities, we've got three good options to do it. But now you can really make those economic decisions. Like I, I really think the 5.8, I, I think probably 89% is probably good enough for me, right? And that, that's something you can work with your grower with. It would not, none of these decisions would be wrong. <clears throat> but instead of 
the multitude of options that you have. Now you've got probably three or four that you can make good educated guesses with the economic component to go along with it. Very nice. So uh, now we're looking at a, uh, uh, a chart here for Cascade. Is that right? Uh, this is our Chapin BTF product. So, you know, if you go back to our, our if you'll <laughs> indulge me in, in some more of my uh, picking out a new truck analogy. Um, we have four models that we offer as, as Jane Irrigation. We offer um, a Chapin BTF product, and that would be our first model that we're going to show here. This is really our workhorse, if you will, for our fruit, our, our be short, seasonal vegetable crops, and even in, even in some fruits like strawberries and melons. You can see that it's offered in a 5 8 and a 7 8 product from a 4 mil up to a 15 mil. <clears throat> and then in most of these mill thicknesses, a 4 inch all the way up to 16 inch spacing. Within these most popular spacings, 8 and 12 inch, we have five flow rate options for 8 inch and we have six flow rate options for 12 inch. It's going to be hard to not find a product here that's going to fit your application in terms of spacing and flow. It is our most popular product in these seasonal vegetable crops and, and, and fruit crops. Uh, we have a bunch of manufacturing capacity for this product, and, and we use this tremendously in that market. Our next model that I'll show you here is our Chapin Deluxe product. Very similar to the BTF, but you can consider it kind of a premium step up. It has a primary filtering inlet that runs continuously along the length of this tape. And so it basically gives you an extra layer of defense against clogging. So um, if you have high organic problems like uh, iron bacteria or algae coming out of a pond, this is a very, very popular product for those applications. Um, and again, seasonal uh, vegetables and fruit crops primarily. Again, 5 8 and 7 8 product, 5 mil all the way to 15 mil. We offer it in a 2 inch all the way up to a 24 inch. And your most common flow rates, eight and 12 inch, we got five, eight, eight inch flow rates, and we have seven 12 inch flow rates. Again, basically impossible to not find a spacing and flow rate in this product line that would work for you, really designed for the, uh, the uh, seasonal fruit and vegetable market. So that's our Chapin Deluxe. So we also have a discrete, go ahead, Richard. I can just interrupt a second. So we really talked about four things to evaluate when you were picking your drip tape, but I'm kind of hearing a fifth now, and is this correct? How clean your water is? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's always going to come into consideration with your emitter selection and then here in the product selection. You'll see some, uh, I, I would say that there are very few instances where this model just will not work over here. It happens. Um, in general, these products will work across a very wide range of soil types, crop types, and water quality. Um, but there are instances where one performs better than the other because of your, your system, and that a lot of times has to do with water quality. So, yeah, you look at the B BTF and the Chapin, those are, are very economical products. We have a lot of uh, production capacity in those products. We have a lot of spacing options. It doesn't change the price. Change, you can change the spacing without changing the price, so it makes it very attractive to those markets, but the, the Lux, does give us kind of an extra layer of defense against water quality issues. Okay, great. And now I'm looking at the Cascade drip tape ordering guide. Right, so the Cascade uh, product line is our discrete emitter product line, a little bit different on the manufacturing process. You'll see some differences here that it's offered in a 5-8, 7-8, 1-8, 1-inch, inch and an eighth, and inch and three-eighth. So from a pretty, pretty small up to a pretty big diameter in terms of tape. It has a lot of variation in, in wall and uh, pipe size, allows us to run really, really long links. We very we do use a little bit of six mil in this product, but some of the manufacturing processes really uh, like it to be eight mil and higher. That's primarily what we're using it in eight mil. We also use a lot of 13 and 15 mil. This is our this is our horse for our SDI market, our, our commodity crop market, uh, cotton corn, soybeans, uh, peanuts. Uh, we use the 13 and the 15 mil. Uh, the nice feature about this product is that spacing, the sky's the limit. We can inject these little emitters in any spacing we want. So we use a lot of 12 inch and, and 14, 16 inch in those seasonal vegetable crops. We do use a lot of this in areas that have uh, 
not a whole lot of organic problems like algae and things like that, but have some problems with sands and silts. These emitters handle that sand and silt very well. So you'll see them in those kind of seasonal crop applications. But we sell a lot of this product in 24, 27, and 30 inch spacings used in that SDI market. So if you, for whatever reason, thought you needed an 18 and a half inch spacing, we can do that in a Cascade product. Yeah. So, uh, well, that's uh, that's pretty fascinating, uh, Michael. Now we uh, we lost your screen. I don't know if you did that on purpose or not, but um, I did not do that on purpose. But I did see that. So let me see if I can <laughs> get that back and go into my back. So, um, yeah. So the cascade. That's really the the, the workhorse for the subsurface drip. That that's correct. It, it really gives us a lot of spacing options, a lot of flow rate options, and we're able to really design that in as far and also uh, pipe diameter sizes. So for really long runs that are required in that subsurface drip market. So that that's really our product for for that market. And uh, what about uh, uh, so pricing differences percentage wise? Are you talking? Uh, twice uh, the expense for uh, Cascade versus some of the other uh, thinner uh, drip tapes? No, they're, they're relatively similar. Um, the thing that you will see with the Cascade is that it varies in price a good bit because the emitter spacing can vary quite a bit. Mm. Um, the, the Chapin products, they basically are the same price regardless of the spacing. So you will see a little bit of difference there. Um, I don't know if my screen share is back up or not, but I'm showing the, the Turbo Tape now, which is our fourth model that we fourth product that we offer, and it's kind of a, bridges the gap between the two. It has some advantages that the Chapin has, and also some of the advantages that the Cascade has. Um, its real big feature is that we can do it do this product with a pretty low flow at a really tight spacing. So its kind of specialty is this six and eight inch spacing, but with lower flow rates than we offer and the uh the cask i mean in the cascade are, are the chapin line so we've got the two different chapin models btf and deluxe deluxe being a little bit better towards water quality issues cascade is really our discrete emitter product we use it with sand and silt problems and water quality really do use a lot of it in our sdi market and then the turbo tape is used for uh, primarily for crops that require really close spacing but we want some lower flow rate so we have a six inch two five we have an eight inch two oh so some really pretty low flow rates uh for for us facing that type yeah you know you uh i had a real aha moment here right when you mentioned the spacing right because i've got to believe knowing the technology that's in these emitters and uh, what they do to uh, not clog uh the emitter itself has to be you know half the price of the uh the tape <laughs> It's a good piece of it. Um, it. It can vary again, depending on how close that spacing is. But yeah, the technology in these emitters and the development of these flow paths, it's pretty remarkable. Um, you know, I always would suggest that if anybody ever wants the opportunity to come visit some of our factories, we'll try to, you know, when, when travel restrictions ease up a little bit, you know, we'd love to accommodate you to our factory. And it really um, brings a lot of um, understanding to how difficult these products are to build and just uh, how hard they are to do well. And we take a lot of pride in doing that. So yeah, you're right. The emitters do carry a lot of design um, criteria to them and are, and are pretty difficult to make. And we take a lot of pride in that. Yeah, and I think too, when you see like a photo that you've got up there now and you see how uniform the crop is across the entire field, you realize how, uh, technical this is, how exact of a science it needs to be in order to get that type of uh, production. That's, that's great. Yeah, it's, it's super important what we're doing, right? Um, we're, we're trying to feed, feed the world um, and we have a little small part of a very big pie and uh, we take that really seriously. And so, yeah, there, there are any questions or comments. Um, I'd love to hear from you. You can see my contact information there. I also put that run length calculator link kind of there at the bottom of the presentation. I can always send this presentation out to you. You drop me or Richard a line. And uh, that's a real cool tool, especially now that maybe you have this presentation to help you narrow that down so you can look at a couple of product lines that can be really beneficial and, and, and um, seeing which product is going to perform best for you. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, um, yeah, please feel free to reach out to me or Richard and we'll get some you know, documents to you or, or we'd love to talk to you about what you're trying to do. Yeah.
Michael, thank you so much. You really made this easy, uh, this uh, organized in my head, a much better way to pick my drip tape, depending on what I'm growing. I really appreciate that. But if somebody does have an issue, question, thinks of something later, it's really okay to reach out to you, uh, to call you, text you, uh, email you? I, I would welcome it. Yeah, I love to hear, for, especially from end users that we don't always get to see the end results. We have a really great relationships with our dealers, but sometimes we don't always get to see it out in the field. And so, yeah, definitely reach out to me um, if you have you need some product, um, if you're looking to a place to source or buy some of this stuff, we'll send, get you in touch with our dealer network. We have dealers all over the U.S. and uh, can provide that, that information to you and put you in touch with somebody and give you pricing and, and, and full design support and all that thing. Yeah. Well, great job today, Michael. Thank you so much for helping us through this. Uh, like I said, I understand it so much better today than I did uh, than I did yesterday. So thank you. Thanks to everybody who watched today. Remember, we've got well over a hundred of these trainings at the jamesusa.com forward slash training site. You can watch all of them there. They're free. You can do it at your leisure. Uh, we also uh, are on uh, everywhere that you listen to your favorite podcasts. So Google Podcasts, Apple uh, Podcasts, iHeartRadio. We're noticing a lot of people are enjoying the podcast these days. I think they're driving on their jobs or from job to job and, and they're learning while they're working. And man, that's refreshing. And, and that gives me a lot of hope for uh, water conservation and sustainability in the future. So thank you guys for that. Again, Michael, thank you. Thanks everybody. And uh, next week, uh, we're going to uh, have uh, Stacy Sternot from Landscapes USA talking about plant materials for uh, Southern California especially during the drought. And then uh, Friday, we've got a special guest, uh, Mark Eriks, one of the uh, premier speakers on California water. Just wrote a book uh, recently called The Dreamt Land, talking about uh, California water issues. And I always uh, smile when I say that, California water issues, because if it's an issue in California for water, it's an issue for the old country. So uh, that'll be next Friday. Hope to see you guys then. Uh, thanks again, and uh, we'll see you all later. Have a good weekend.